On the other hand, the reps that really view that profile as a resource center that they've created to help customers, if you go to that profile and you see what's going on, you're, you're thinking, wow, this person is legit. They are authentic. They are really here to serve. And I can see based on this wealth of content that they've built up over time on their profile that they really mean to be a partner with me. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez, Jr., You're now listening to Selling with Social. There's no recovery from a bad first impression, both in dating and sales. Your sales reps need to sell better and smarter from the onset to ensure a good customer experience. That is why you should visit calidusclouddotcom forward slash vengresso to view the webinar recording that will change your perspective on the selling experience and how you can improve. That's calidusclouddotcom forward slash Vengresso. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to be here with my good friend, Mr. Justin Schreiber, actually a repeat on Selling with Social And for those of you that don't remember, he was on one of our 2017 set of podcasts. And Justin is with me, the Vice President of Marketing for LinkedIn Sales and Marketing Solutions. Mr. Schreiber, my friend, welcome to the show, my friend. Boy, it's great to be here. That was high pressure. And and to know that I made the cut and got back on the show, that's like big time for me. Truth be told, there are only two people in the history of Selling with Social that have actually been on twice and you have made one of those two people i'm a hall of famer you're a hall of famer that's exactly right but that's because you got such great content man and uh we actually are have some good stuff to talk about today and we were spending some time and when we were at dreamforce we sat and talked for a good while and i appreciate catching up with you it's always great catching up with you justin and we start talking about marketing and sales alignment abm strategies and you talked about something that was really interesting marketing and sales orchestration. And I thought, man, we've got to have this topic here on Selling with Social. But before we do in, get into that topic, just do us a favor. We've got a lot of new listeners, of course, to the show. We've got sales, we've got marketers, we've got salespeople, business owners. Do me a favor, tell us a little bit about you. And then the second part is, I want to know something about you that nobody would know by looking at your social profile. So first about you, my friend. Okay. I love sales. I love marketing. I've actually been responsible for sales organizations. I've been responsible for marketing organizations, had the chance to build product and sell product. And in the process, feel like I've gained a real empathy for what it takes to work with customers to solve their problems. There are amazing highs. There's also amazing lows. And I'm really excited to be at LinkedIn and be able to focus full time on the space. On the personal front, I am a father of five. And those kids keep me busy. Got a daughter in college right now, and the youngest is 10 years old. So we've got about eight more years of fun before the last one's out of the house. It goes way too fast, though. So I'm enjoying every minute of it. Oh, you got me beat. I stopped at two. I got an eight-year-old and the four-year-old, as you know, and I just, I can't even keep up with two. I don't know. By the time the third, fourth, fifth one, I'm I'm sure it's just all like the world's blur together, I, I would imagine. Well, here's the thing. We had the Sienna minivan and what we realized is that at five, we maxed it out. So that's where we had to hold the line. (laughs) So you didn't want to go up to the next level car where you had to drive a bus around. (laughs) Put the trailer on the back and the the younger kids get to go back there. Now we decided to opt against that option. I got it. I love it. Fantastic. You know, this is a great discussion here to have all around marketing and sales and wait, um, wait, Mario, you didn't ask me about what's not on my LinkedIn profile. Oh, I forgot. Well, I thought, that, well, I'm sorry. I would assume that that was what you were talking about. So no, my bad. I'm, I've got something really important for the listeners to know about. I want something juicy, man, because, you know, I've talked about this before. 
The bar is high. The bar is high. As you know, we talked about this before. All my listeners have heard this one before. Extra appendages, thumbs, that is. So I don't know. You got something better than that? I don't know if I have something better than that, but I do have a dramatic story. I've got two chickens in my backyard. And one night I hear these chickens raising all cane in the backyard. I go down and a raccoon literally had one of these chickens in its mouth, oh. mouth around the neck. And so I call my wife on the cell phone because you never want to turn your back on a raccoon. That's a little tip for all the listeners. Never turn your back on a raccoon. And I go, Julie, bring Jack's baseball bat out. So she brings the baseball bat out. And I faced that raccoon down with a baseball bat. We didn't have to get into it. We both mutually respected each other's space. The raccoon backed off and the chickens to this day are still intact. <laughs> so he lightly had the chicken in his mouth that didn't crush down on it. That's pretty interesting. Oh, I guess I probably shouldn't ask the question if you smacked it. I mean, no, we, no, no smacking was done. Like I said, the raccoon looked at me and knew that I was all business. I looked at the raccoon and knew the raccoon was all business. So we both mutually retreated and uh, no animals were injured in the process. No animals were injured in the process. Okay, for all of our animal lovers out there, note that we had no injuries whatsoever, but uh, you stood your ground. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great story. You know, you should probably talk about how uh, that might lead into some great marketing and sales alignment, right? <laughs> yeah. Care, speak softly and carry a big bat. Exactly right. <laughs> I love it. So do me a favor. We're talking about this concept here, a great story. And we started talking about what you coined as MSO, Marketing Sales Orchestration. Talk to a little bit about what is MSO? I would say that MSO is the logical extension of ABM. It's a term that most of us are familiar with. I think that ABM has done a great job of reshaping thinking around how marketers go to market. And it's got strengths. It's also, though, got its downside. If you think about the acronym itself, the A stands for account and the M stands for marketing. One of the things that I've learned, though, as you're working with customers is that ultimately, Decisions aren't made in an account level. They're made at a buyer committee level. Right. You could be calling on GE, for example, and there could be any number of different buyer committees that you're calling in to, to get deals done. So I think we need to expand that notion of the term. And then marketing, obviously, is only half the equation. Sales is the other half. So ultimately, what marketing and sales orchestration looks to do is zero in on who the decision makers are and create a well-aligned and orchestrated experience between sales and marketing to deliver the goods. But help me understand though, that sounds like what you just described very much is what we would consider ABM to be. So I guess, how is that specifically different from ABM? So with respect to MSO, there are two halves to it. The first is the planning half and the second is the execution half. On the planning side, it actually, uh, the process starts well before you're into an account and trying to think about how to access and, and close that account. It starts with prioritizing the accounts that you should call upon in the first place, how you're cutting sales territories. And what's unique about this approach is that rather than marketing simply looking at their data and saying, hey, here are accounts in the past that have engaged with our marketing, let's continue to call on them, or sales saying, here are customers that have a high propensity of doing business with us. The data from sales and marketing is pooled together. And that integrated set of data allows companies to, first of all, create a prioritized list of accounts. Once you've got a prioritized list of accounts, step number two is to identify the buyer committee within those accounts. And again, sales and marketing are sitting around the table working on this process together. And then from there, you start to build strategy around how you can access those buyer committees and ultimately run a marketing and sales motion against them. With ABM, what I find happens a lot of times is all of the account prioritization happens with sales and then marketing gets the phone call. Hey, here are the accounts that we're going after. We got a sales strategy. Can you guys put some ABM against this as well? So it's still a very separate process, um, albeit focused on the account. Gotcha. And that's very true. Uh, in fact, some of the conversations that we even have internally here at Vingresso is, you know, what are the types of accounts that we're going after and, and then start applying strategies to that as opposed to, I think one of the big differences that you just mentioned is, is where sales and marketing are sitting together and they're agreeing 
on the accounts. But you used, I think, a point of reference here. It's based upon data, based upon analytics, or based upon information. Before we go into talking about why this is so important, talk to me a little bit about who is involved when sales and marketing are sitting down. Is this the account manager or is this senior sales leadership? And what data should they be pulling from versus what data should marketing be pulling from? So first of all, to talk about the data question, if you think about it, marketing has only partial data and sales has only partial data. As a marketer, I can tell you exactly the kinds of audiences that are engaging with the campaigns that I send out, Mm -hmm. which is going to give me an indicator of kind of general universes of people that I want to focus on. But as a sales professional, I can tell you which accounts I close specifically. I can tell you who got involved in the deal in those accounts. So by combining that data, number one, you're able to expand for sales the total accounts that they could be calling on. But from a marketing perspective, suddenly they're learning about the specific roles that are engaging and they can be much more targeted in the kinds of programs they put together. So usually as a starting point, uh, there needs to be a technology that's able to integrate the data. And there's some kind of a strategy team that will pull through that data, either in a manual or an automated way, and surface the insights. Once the insights are surfaced, you typically have leadership from both sales and marketing that agree on the general set of accounts that should be focused on. And from there, you can actually parse them out into smaller teams, and teams can collaborate to build account and committee-specific strategies. Do you see this as a play inside of only the big giant accounts that you want to go after, you know, the huge elephants, or is this a play down into the, say the uh, SMB sector where you've got maybe a, your company may focus on that, or you've got a a large organization that focuses on the SMB and mid market. I think it's a play for both. The larger companies are going to have more resources to throw at the problem, but they're also going to have a much more complicated process and are going to be calling on probably a much broader range of accounts. Small accounts or small businesses tend to be more focused, at least initially, and there tend to be less siloed thinking. So it's easier for sales and marketing to come together. So you might take a slightly different approach, but in both cases, the MSO philosophy is applicable. You talked about this, why does it matter, right? So when you think about the MSO, marketing sales orchestration, and how is that different from ABM, sales and marketing alignment is oftentimes we hear this. Why is this important for us to be thinking about this and doing or executing on? Because ultimately it creates a better customer experience. And if customers are happy, they're much more inclined to do business with you, not just initially, but over the long term. And that's true. I I would agree with you in terms of a better customer experience because you're targeting essentially customers that are going to be a good fit for you. And if they have a buying need, any other reasons behind better customer experience? Like how does this result in a better customer experience? Is that because we've now got more targeted, personalized messaging content and materials that are going out as opposed to the spray and pray? Or break that down for me in terms of why this would result in a better customer experience. So I mentioned before that there are two sides to MSO. The first side is the planning, and the second side is the actual execution. Once a team has come together and said, these are the accounts that we're going to focus on, here are the personas that comprise a buying committee, and here's the strategy that we're going to execute, then you actually get into the process of reaching out and and touching those customers and creating that experience. And when marketing and sales can completely align and integrate on that process, amazing things happen. I'll give you a couple of examples. On the front end, a marketer could reach out and send in cold email, and that may or may not get traction. But if the target audience is connected via social platforms to people at the account, those connections could actually send in content and information via their feed that's going to be relevant. And because there's already a trusted relationship there, the impact that that content is going to have is going to be much higher than it would in a cold email. You progress through the process and now you're actually into a deal and you're trying to close business. And now traditionally people have thought, hey, this is the work of sales. Marketing doesn't need to engage. But what if simultaneously, as I'm negotiating a deal, that same individual from procurement is getting content delivered from marketing that says, here are a couple of case studies that talk about other companies like you and the benefit that they've achieved. You're reinforcing now what the salesperson is trying to talk about as they are negotiating the deal. It all feels very seamless. Marketing and sales both play a part, 
but it is to achieve a greater end. And because of those well-integrated touch points, that's where you're seeing sales cycle times reduce and you're seeing conversion rates increase. Obviously, you're, you're with LinkedIn and obviously one of our biggest partners for Vingresso. And I want to get into talking about how you might play into this more targeted and focused, hyper-personalized messaging, utilizing not just, you talked about email, like sending out emails, Mm -hmm. but also if you're targeting correctly and you're socially surrounding your 6.8 buyers that you've got inside of account, you're definitely oftentimes connecting with those buyers through a platform like LinkedIn. Isn't there a way to be able to use messaging when you meet a new contact or you welcome a new contact, isn't there a great way to be able to create hyper-personalized messages through the platform as well so that you're not just touching them on email, you're actually using a omni-channel approach to engaging with buyers? I think that's a great point. And it's important to understand the full spectrum of channels that you have to engage with a customer. One of the underutilized channels, in my opinion, is the presence that companies themselves have on Uh, social platforms. So on the LinkedIn platform, for example, we give companies the opportunity to build what we call company pages. And on those pages, they can showcase what they're about, but they can also share relevant information people can subscribe to or follow that. And then employees at your company can also share that out. That's a very non-invasive way to insert yourself into a larger set of communities organically. Yeah. From there, you then move on to traditional marketing through email channels, for example. But in addition to that, you can leverage things like the LinkedIn feed. And in the LinkedIn feed, you can assert relevant messaging that's targeted at particular audiences. LinkedIn also offers a product called InMail. And InMail is an alternative to email. Uh, It's essentially uh, our messaging platform. And one of the things that you can do with InMail is identify relevant pieces of, of information related to the person you're reaching out to. What kind of content are they sharing? What are the things that they talk about when they get on the platform? What are some of the details they shared in their profile? And we've actually found that by inserting personalized elements into your in-mail, you're able to increase the response rate by 30, 40%. And then in addition to that, uh, you've got other channels. One of the things that I get the most excited about is a product that we call Point Drive. Point Drive is essentially a uh, container that you can build with a URL behind it I can email Mario you that, that URL, and then when you open it up, you've got a full set of content that you can access. And as you access it, I, as the seller, get a signal that says, Mario's checking this out, and that helps me to know whether or not I'm relevant based on what I'm sending through. Yeah, you get listed a, a number of great uh, channels. And you know what I find, Justin, is a, in our customer base, about nine out of 10 customers that have Sales Navigator are not leveraging the tool Point Drive. It's a phenomenal tool from a sales perspective because the analytics I get, I get to see that you opened it. I get to see what you clicked on. I get to see what you actually read. And I get to see a lot of those analytics that allow me to be able to say, hmm, so Justin is more interested in solving this problem as opposed to maybe another particular problem that your company may be able to solve. Let me now target messaging around this because he clicked on you know, this article, this video, this whatever it might, white paper, research paper, whatever it might be that I can now make better educated decisions on how to engage with my particular buyer. And that goes back to this, like one of the challenges that I see, whether it's you want to start with the ABM concept, you want to talk about the marketing and sales orchestration and the execution of MSO, right? One of the challenges I see is sales reps don't know what to do once I've gotten past go, right? Mm -hmm. You got me past go. I got now potentially a conversation, but how do I leverage content valuable information, the value add piece to be able to continue driving a discussion. Any commentary on that in terms of best practices? And and we may be getting into some of the things that we talked about as potential challenges that you need to overcome. And this may or may not have been one of yours that you had. That's another place where marketing and sales working together can do it better. So a salesperson gets that first meeting, it goes great. But the classic question is always, where do I go from here? How do I continue to engage with the customer and progress that relationship? Because marketers specialize in developing personas and have a tremendous amount of data around the kinds of content that specific personas are latching onto, what they can do with sales is they can come to a salesperson and say, hey, you're talking to this kind of a person. This is some great content that you could send into that account. And they can package it up in different ways. I mentioned Point Drive already. We've seen customers that will actually build 
point drive containers. They'll pre-populate them and each container will represent or be relevant to a different persona at a different place in the buying stage. And now all the salesperson needs to do is pull that down and send it through. But regardless of the delivery mechanism, relying on marketers to help produce some of that content and explain when it's relevant and to whom it's relevant gives the salesperson a tremendous advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other challenges that I've seen as well, this actually just happened last week. I received a, quote, customize LinkedIn invitation from somebody I did not know. And, you know, as an influencer, I get a lot of invites from sales folks who want to follow, you know, our content. So I'm not surprised by it. But the message was, hi, Mario, comma. And then it proceeded to talk about um, they wanted to uh, potentially meet me at a conference that was happening in Europe. (laughs) Of course, I wasn't going to this conference and I don't know why they would have thought I was going to this conference and the fact that they wanted to connect. And um, then there were some grammar problems inside the messaging. So what it led me to believe was either it was a fake profile, number one, or number two, that the individual clearly was using LinkedIn automation, which is specifically prohibited against LinkedIn's terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. And all they did was run a search filter and uh, I got pulled into the search filter and then an automation message went out, right? And so oftentimes we see from sales folks, we see a cut and paste, cut and paste, and especially with things like connecting with somebody. If you want to connect with me as a buyer, you've got to connect, not just connect. You know what I mean? Like the the difference between connect with me, connect with me on a personal level. And this particular one was just a really bad example of what not to do in terms of sending out a personalized LinkedIn invite. I would tell you that a lot of sales reps make the mistake of not understanding how you can actually start this relationship building right from the point when you say hello, right? From the hello Mario. It can start there with the connection message and it trails all the way through as you talked about when you make outreach or when you have a meeting and now what, what is the next step that you do, right? Yeah, I agree with that. And I would even say that the relationship starts even before that first email goes out. It can be a highly personalized email. That's super important as you've, you've mentioned. What we are finding happens more and more though is the buyer, before they even respond to an in-mail, they'll check out the profile of that salesperson. So we always knew that salespeople were looking at profiles of buyers, but this is kind of a revelation. Buyers look at the profiles of sales professionals as well. And they're looking for a couple things. Number one, has this salesperson demonstrated through their profile that they have expertise and relevance to me? Have they showed over time that they are willing to provide service to their customers? Can I see, for example, an ongoing history of engagement on key topics that I care about? Can I see thoughtful responses? Can I see a set of resources that are meaningful to me? If I reach out and I send a great personalized email to you, but then when you hit my profile, you see that it's just a billboard for how great I am, it's game over. You've already disqualified yourself. On the other hand, the reps that really view that profile as a resource center that they've created to help customers, if you go to that profile and you see what's going on, you're you're thinking, wow, this person is legit. They are authentic. They are really here to serve. And I can see based on this wealth of content that they've built up over time on their profile that they really mean to be a partner with me. Yeah. You know, we like to call this turning your resume into a resource, right? Mm -hmm. And making sure that you don't lose your buyer on the first click Mm -hmm. into your profile. But you guys actually just released, I think it was a week or two ago, was the state of sales report for 2018. And if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on the stat, either it was 62 or 64, one of the two. I thought it was 64. 64% of buyers reported that they look back at a rep's profile to determine whether or not they're going to engage. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's huge. And then when we saw that, you know, because you know, one of our big plays when we work with customers is redoing the entire profile for their sales organization to speak to who they help, how they help, what business problem they solve, bring in the content and the multimedia that actually speaks and answers those questions. And seeing that validated what we've been saying all along is if you're going to socially engage or digitally engage with a buyer, whether it's through point drive, an email, a text, there's a high probability that those buyers, in this case, 64%, if I'm not mistaken, was the number, 64% are going to look back at your profile and what do they see? And oftentimes what we see is quota, crushing, 
sales rep, <laughs> all-time president's club earner, 17-time year in a row, right? Those types of things. The resume, and I think sales reps and sales leaders are really starting to understand that the buyers are able to do a lot more research than what they originally expected. That's right. So here's another interesting stat for you. On the sales side, a sales professional ranks trust, the trust they're able to cultivate with buyers as the number one factor in closing deals. It's above ROI, it's above price. 40% of of sales professionals position it that way. 51% of decision makers rank trust as the top factor they desire in a salesperson. So that's beyond they can get me the right price and other factors that might come into consideration. Yeah, it's a great point. This really goes back and it personifies what we're talking about here in terms of marketing and sales alignment and this execution half that you started talking about, which is half the battle is planning who you're going to target and how you're going to target and what you're going to do. And the other half is now actually doing it right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't do it right, well, to your point, by the way, was that stat from the state of sales report? It was. Yeah. So if you don't do it right, the ranking of trust, of, of building trust that you can help me solve a problem and that you are the right person to do it or your company's the right person to do it. Well, that's 51% of them said, you know, like this is the top priority for me, right? So that, that just goes back to what we always have known and what we've always talked about human to human selling. Like we're, <laughs> we're buying from humans for God's sakes. Well, listen, I want to actually talk a little bit more about some of the potential challenges that a sales or marketing organization need to overcome to be successful. But before we do that, Justin, I want to take a short break and listen to this message from our program sponsor. Do you feel like your sales team spends more time updating and completing administrative tasks than they do engaging with customers? CRM was supposed to automate the sales process, but instead created more manual processes. SAP Sales Cloud introduces modern CRM to the industry so that you can sell more and enable your team to be more efficient, effective, and intelligent. SAP Sales Cloud offers solutions to optimize your sales process, accelerate quotes and contracts, and enable corporate learning. No matter what industry you're in, you can build processes around what your salespeople do best. With SAP Sales Cloud, sales as you know it is about to change. Learn more by visiting calidusclouddotcom forward slash Vengresso today. That's C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S cloud.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. Okay. Right before we, that particular break, we were talking about some of the challenges, other challenges, potential challenges that organizations need to overcome to be successful. Talk to me a little bit about some of the other potential challenges that we haven't talked about. Challenge number one is the data. Sales organizations run out of CRM. Marketing organizations run out of a DMP. Even if you've got the same contacts in both systems, you're tagging them different. There's different information. It's really hard to reconcile the data. If you don't have a common understanding of who the customer is, it's really hard to come together and align behind how to help that customer. And so what do you do? (laughs) Don't leave me hanging like that. (laughs) (laughs) So the reality is companies are highly invested in CRM. They're highly invested in marketing automation. And those systems are not going to go away anytime soon. They're wired into the go-to-market. And I think that we need to take a pragmatic approach to how we work with the data that we've got. So I think that there is an opportunity in a more bespoke way to weave together data and the technology is becoming better and better now to identify common uh, criteria that allows you to match data and merge data. And having some kind of an integrated data warehouse makes a lot of sense. From a LinkedIn perspective, one of the most compelling features that the customers often point out is the fact that the marketing solution runs on the same data set as the sales solution. We have 600 million members now, and those members share information about themselves that is helpful to marketers as they reach out, and it's helpful to salespeople as they reach out. And because everybody's looking at the same underlying data, it's a lot easier to have a coherent conversation. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, that 
goes perfectly in line with what, what, what we advocate. And of course, as you know, is, well, before you engage with the buyer, at least for God's sakes, check their LinkedIn profile out, <laughs> Yeah, right? Figure out who they are and what they're all about. And this is a great one. I, I love this one. I was at a conference recently and uh, I was the conference MC for the sales conference. And uh, as soon as the conference came back and ended on a Friday, that Monday, I got a phone call. It was a cold call from one of the sales reps, the SDRs that, you know, my name got put into the bucket and they started, you know, passing around and I got emails and phone calls galore. And I happened to pick up on this one cold call. And so the gentleman said, hey, this is uh, so-and-so from such and such company. And as soon as he said the company, I knew exactly who they were because obviously I'm in sales and sales technologies. We're talking about this. So I knew exactly what they were. And he says, I was giving you a call to uh, talk about some of the things that you guys are working on in terms of your, you know, prospecting outreach. And um, immediately we started talking about cold call, outsourcing, those types of things. And so I said, I go, um, let me ask you a question. Did you happen to look at my LinkedIn profile or even our website before calling? And he said, well, to be honest, since you asked me a question, I'm going to be honest with you. No, I did not. And I said, Okay. Had you looked at it, <laughs> you would have noticed that we are the largest digital sales training company out there in the market and that we don't cold call. <laughs> so uh, I think it's a bad conversation for you and I to be having. And oh, by the way, I know your CEO very, very well. We're connected. And you'll, if you actually ask him, what is the relationship? He'll tell you what our relationship is, which is completely positive. So do me a favor. Tell him I said hi. And he felt so bad. He was like, I'm so sorry. You're right. That I should have known better. And I, you know, I didn't do that. But Here's the reality, Justin. The reality is, is that many of our sales leaders are managing their sales teams based upon quantitative activities. And those quantitative activities do not drive the qualitative types of engagements that are required to reach today's buyer. Like as an example, look at my profile before you even call me so that we can find some common ground. Are you seeing the same thing? Absolutely. And it goes beyond sales. You're correct that as a sales professional, if I look at your profile, not only do I see the demographic details, where you work, where you live, I can see the kinds of conversations that you're engaging in. I can see the things that you've posted. And it's a great way to start a conversation, jump on and say, hey, Mario, love the post that you made. Couldn't agree more with this point. By the way, have you thought about that point? And suddenly I'm into a conversation without the niceties of, of trying to figure out who you are and what you're about. On the marketing side, there's tremendous value as well. As a marketer, I can see that this is the audience that tends to engage with me and I can do profile matching to suddenly discover that attributes associated with your profile are in line with what other people that I've been able to reach have exhibited. And in that way, I can be relevant from a marketing perspective as well. So this is table stakes now. And if companies are doing this, they're really alienating the audiences that they're trying to attract. And that's exactly what's happening and what our buyers are saying to us. As an example, in your state of sales report, there were, if I'm not mistaken, about 600 respondents to this particular question. And it clearly showed 64% of them say, I'm going to look back at your profile to see who you are and what you're all about to determine whether or not I'm actually going to engage with you, right? So it's like, hmm, if almost two thirds of our buyers are doing that to you, why are you not doing that 100% of the time to your buyers? Yeah. And it really highlights a big problem that quite frankly, I mean, as you know, we love LinkedIn, we're, we're massive advocates of, of the platform. It really highlights the opportunity that sales and marketing, to your point, can leverage LinkedIn in terms of being able to engage with buyers, understand their buyers, and even for God's sakes, now we can search on content specific to hashtag IT as an example, if you're selling to the, to the IT leader or you know security or something like that, and to find content that we can actually engage with with uh, our prospective buyers. Are there any other ways that you see LinkedIn involved in this equation? You know, you just mentioned topics that are relevant. One of the things I'm most excited about with respect to our new LinkedIn pages strategy is first of all, I can run analysis to find out whom I'm attracting. And if I notice that there's a gap, I can then do a search across all of LinkedIn to determine what kind of content and what topics the people that I'm trying to attract are engaging with. And once I know that, I can start to double down on posting that kind of content. And it's not just internally generated content. I can pull together content from other sources as well. But the point is, I now know what the people I'm trying to tar target care about, and I can build my site around that notion. This is just 
plain, simple relevance. I view it as a courtesy to the people that you're interacting with. And in exchange for that courtesy, they're going to be willing to give you their mind share. And by the time this podcast publishes, you, if I'm not mistaken, will have pretty much done a, a US deployment of the new LinkedIn pages that marketing will be able to leverage and benefit from. Will sales reps also be able to benefit from the new LinkedIn pages or company pages? Absolutely. So there's a very close correlation between pages and the other things that are going on across sales and marketing. The starting point, think of pages as the company's place in the world's professional network. That's kind of home base, if you will. You're able to call information, post it there, but you can then share it with employees like salespeople and salespeople can then rebroadcast that information through their own channels. So you're able to essentially amplify the core messages that the company is trying to share, but do it in a very authentic way through people that your prospects are going to trust and whom they already know. Once that conversation gets up and running, salespeople can take the baton and really start to go down the path of developing a sales process and ultimately closing customers and building that relationship once it's closed. And correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have to have tools like Elevate for me as a marketing organization to allow, to push this out to my salespeople for them to share and amplify. Is that correct? Yeah, there's different ways to do it. Elevate, for those of you that don't know, is our employee advocacy program. It allows companies to curate content and then share that in a formal way with anyone in the organization, and then they can reshare it. But there's many ways that you can uh, exchange information with your employees and get it out to the broader audience. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the new features and functions of, of LinkedIn pages, correct? Yep. Fantastic. So that'll be exciting to watch. Uh, what about things like uh, leveraging video, uh, LinkedIn native video, as a seller or for marketing? I've been noticing a lot more play that companies are putting native video onto their company channels. But as a seller, should I be leveraging LinkedIn video natively on my profile? And do I get greater visibility if I do? I think there's a demographic shift right now towards video. You're not just seeing video leveraged by marketing and sales, but in general, the way that we consume information is much more video centric. And because of that, sales organizations that adopt that platform and use it to, again, connect with customers, to share value propositions, are going to be in a much better position to create and build on authentic relationships. And do you think that sales reps should be creating their own videos that they could publish onto their own personal news feeds as well? Absolutely. In fact, I've got a great example of that. The head of sales for our LinkedIn marketing solutions business has a video series that he has coined Walk to Work. And mm -hmm. so on a regular basis, as he's walking to work, he pulls his iPhone out and he shares things that are top of mind for him. He has generated a huge follower base as a result of that. And by the way, he's not talking about LinkedIn marketing solutions and why you should buy them. He's talking about things that a head of sales is thinking about and cares about. Because he's willing to share that part of himself with others and because people see the video and know the person behind the ideas, he's already generating a relationship that he can build on when it comes time to actually do business with the customer. I'll give you uh, one other case uh, study that literally just happened today. So our director of sales reached out to me and said, hey, we've got something unique. Um, there's a company that is really is looking for X. I'm kind of not sure what to exactly to do here. Can you get on the phone with me and help me figure out like what's the best direction because it really doesn't fit our, our standard. But what I wanted to know when I first got on the phone is, is why did you reach out to us? How did you get to us? Now, as you know, we're very prolific in terms of social engagement and our, our content. But what was interesting was the buyer said, I actually started following Vivica Von Rosen, who's our chief visibility officer. I actually started watching her videos and she publishes some amazing video content on the how, the what, the when, the where that I realized as I started looking at some of your folks in the industry, I actually built a relationship with her without even ever talking to her because I was actually looking at her face. And I'm like, I feel like I can trust this person because I don't know if I should be telling you that, but, but that's what he said. And so it was interesting is statistics show top five marketing tactics going into 2019 for every marketing organization is using video right? 
So this is one of the challenges that I've seen in the, in the sales line of business is, is if we know that marketers are launching and using video in the marketing process for one to many, why would we not think that as salespeople, we should not be using this one to one? Because all we're doing is marketing one to one versus one to many. And as salespeople, we need to start thinking about how to leverage these things because guess what? Video allows us to be able to build trust. There is a science empirical data and proof that shows you see my face, you build trust in oftentimes in, in what it is that I'm saying. And I think this is a huge area of opportunity. For those that aren't convinced, I would invite them to do a little experiment. Post something on LinkedIn, uh, a short comment or uh, a post with a written word, and then come back and share a video on LinkedIn. And look at the number of likes and the number of comments that you get on the two you will discover that engagement against video is significantly higher than it is against the written word. Yeah, and we also uh, leverage a tool called Zubtitles, where any video that we take, we actually put into Zubtitles and we can put the subtitles on the video. We have found that even adding on those subtitles that we're getting a lot more engagement because people don't have to hit the volume button, right, to be able to listen to it. They can watch the whole thing and read all the words while they're in the privacy of on BART as an example, which is our metro train transportation here in the Bay Area. So wherever, BART, bus, doesn't matter. That has also increased our engagement as well with using subtitles. So it was cheap. It's like a couple bucks to be able to put a video through for a few minutes, right? So it's not that expensive to be able to use those types of technologies. In any case, great conversation. And I really think that this is the next evolution of selling is really mapping to today's buyer and how the buyer wants to consume information. I'm going to do one more anecdotal sample here. And I, I gave this in a presentation I was giving back at uh, Open Talk in the sales keynote. We, Vingresso, are looking at deploying out a new technology uh, for our customer base. And we've evaluated 27 different vendors. Yes, the number was 27. We narrowed it down to 10 that we wanted to actually talk to, right? So we did our research. We went behind closed doors. We said, who are the right folks? Do they have this, this, and that? Okay. And then we said, all right, about two thirds of the stuff that we can find, these 10 have it. Now let's start doing some deep dive with these 10. And what we figured out was that of these 10, we wanted to have these conversations with these folks. And so we reached out and we said, here's our list of 23 things that we're looking for. Here's our buying process. This is our buying time frame, And yes, we have a budget and we're ready to buy. What I need from you now at this point is I need a conversation with your salesperson and your sales engineer. And I want to line up a conversation with your executive lead team. And do you know, Justin, out of those 10, those 10 providers, only one, only one company, which we decided not to go with, only one company followed our process. Everybody else? fought us tooth and nail and said, no, you need to talk to the BDR first. Then after I talked to the BDR, then I could talk to a salesperson. And then after I talked to a salesperson, then I could work on another meeting with the engineer. And then if all met, we can probably align ourselves with an executive. And it was, it was so crazy to me because I was like, guys, do you realize that everything I need to know, I just need a demo to see if you guys can get the nuts and bolts. And that was really frustrating. As I tell that story, I think about it, super frustrating because I had a journey that I was on and nobody wanted to follow it except for one, which we couldn't use because there was a technical component that we wouldn't work for us. But everybody else forced us to go through their sales process as opposed to my buyer's process. And I really think that's one of the things that we're talking about here in terms of marketing and sales orchestration is understanding the buyer's journey and understanding how to engage ourselves with that buyer and make it easier for customers to say, yes, I want to buy from you. Am I wrong? I love that story. I think it fits beautifully with the philosophy. At the end of the day, the best sales professionals are partners to the buyer. They understand the buying journey that the customer is on and they're willing to adapt to that and be a part of that process rather than feeling like they got to wrangle control and get the buyer to a place where the buyer doesn't want to be. And you know, one of my all time classic stories of this example I gave you, I was like, look guys, you guys are freaking frustrating me. Let me get on the phone. Let's do a couple of meetings. And then I said, now I want to talk to, you know, your executive and they wanted to talk about pricing and budget. Now, this is one of our finalists, the last two that we selected, and they wanted to talk about my budget. And I said, look, I'm about a relationship. I need to talk to your executive. They refused to put me in touch until I actually went to the VP of sales. So you know what I did? I used the tools that are available, 
seamless.ai, find the CEO's mobile phone number, found the mobile phone number, picked up the phone, called him and said, I need to book a meeting with you and here's why. <laughs> and so the sales rep, him and his VP just unleashed. They were furious that I went around them and I'm like, dude, I told you what my buying process was. I don't understand what you didn't know. Like, did you not think I could find a phone number? Like, don't you have these tools? <laughs> so I love it. I love it. It was, a, it was a funny story. But look, we talked a lot about marketing, sales, orchestration, alignment. If I wanted to start this tomorrow, what are my next steps? What advice do you give to the sales leaders and marketing leaders listening in? I think, first of all, get alignment between sales and marketing that this is a priority and put your senior people on it. The teams are going to follow. Secondly, you need to focus on the data that's a huge barrier that often keeps the best intention team separated. And then third, you need to look at a process where the sales and the marketing team are in the room at the same time at every step of the process, from planning to execution to post-mortem evaluation, and then going through the cycle again. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Alignment, data, process. Did I get that right, Justin? That's it. I love it. Fantastic insights from my friend, Justin Schreiber. Justin, do me a favor. If someone wants to get a hold of you, connect with you, should they tweet at you? Should they connect with you online through LinkedIn? Or how is the best way to connect up with you? I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, Mario. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> so they should connect with you on LinkedIn. And if they do, they should send a personalized invite to say, Justin, I heard you on Selling with Social. Yeah. Tell me what you enjoyed most about this podcast. Great way to start a conversation. Fantastic. Now, do me a favor. Last question I've got for you, my friend. Your all-time favorite movie, what is it? Oh, Mario, that's an easy one. It's definitely got to be Cool Hand Luke. Cool Hand Luke, all right. Sometimes nothing is a pretty cool hand. <laughs> I love it. Justin, it's been great having you on as my second only in Selling with Social History to be a repeat on the podcast. You've been an awesome uh, guest here. And for all of you, uh, make sure you connect up with my friend, Justin. Great guy to follow and some great insights. And for all of you listening in right now, go ahead and listen in to this message here. Take care. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. This podcast was brought to you by SAP Sales Cloud. Here's what I want you to do right now. Learn more about SAP Sales Cloud by visiting calidascloud.com forward slash Ben Gresso. That's C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S cloud.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.